All right, all right. Um, so my name is Philip, um, usually known as FalkDX around the community. I want to talk about plugins, um, why they exist, uh, differences between them a little bit. It's going to be more of a technical talk. Um, so if you want at any time, please raise your hand if you have any questions. The intention is to make sure you understand the talk rather than me just saying things. Um, so any question, just let me know. Um, if it's a short one, you can just raise your hands. I'll um, point to you. You can say it and I'll repeat it to the microphone. Uh, otherwise, um, hopefully someone brings the microphone to you if it's something a bit longer. Um, I assume that people here know what a digital work audio workstation is or a plugin host uh, and actually what a plugin is. Hopefully with this we can uh, continue. Um, why am I doing this myself? Um, I mean, I think users get a lot confused because we have so many plugin standards. It might, it gets a bit confusing. Um, not sure exactly what to use, what are the bad things, good things about each other. Um, I did myself a plugin host um, and also developed some a few plugins in a range of formats. So I. I know a little bit of uh, the topic. I have to start with some small disclaimers. The first is a bit controversial, but I want to put it um, to say it right away that um, open source software by itself does not really need plugins because everything is open. We can make an application, we can compile everything statically. Um, if someone makes a plugin, we can copy it inside our own application, and that's it. I mean, the most point of making plugins uh, is to load external things that are not ready when we uh, ship our application, um, and mostly regarding commercial software. Um, it's a bit tricky. There are good things, bad things about plugins, but we do need it right now, because in the real world, we want to use commercial plugins. Um, if it, everything was open source, we'll not need it, but it's not the case. Um, and also, making good plugins is really, really hard. Um, there's a small, sm there's a threshold first, if you want to do a, a plugin, you have to be a developer, you have to know a little bit about um, the programming language that you're using, the pl that you're coding the plugin in. But after this, if you follow some examples, it's usually simple. The thing is, there's a lot of work behind the scenes to actually make something nice and something that works really well. And well, we have to keep that in mind. Like, it starts with a little, uh, how do I say it? The curve goes quite a lot uh, goes up quite a lot initially because you have to know some programming and it's quite technical. Then you can follow some basic programming, copy and code, actually, yeah. Um, you can use pre-made pre -made things, watch some tutorials, everything is good. Hack, like copy and paste some code that people already made, some filters, hack it together, try it out. I actually heard some developers actually saying this. Worked in hardware, that's good for me, it's good, ship it. <laughs> and I mean, that's not easy, that's not um, a good thing for, um, for the community in general sometimes. Because if you have a plugin that works in a specific application, but you never actually bother to try in another host, you didn't actually make an audio plugin per se, you made an audio plugin for hardware in this case. So it's... It's an audio plugin that works in Ardor, but you don't really know if it works in somewhere else or not. So, um, <laughs> okay. but anyway, the hard way is it requires a lot more. You should, like usually developers investigate the plugin formats that are available, so they don't start coding right away and then make a mistake to realize the specific format requires specific things. Then you have to restructure the, the, your entire code, and it becomes a mess. So there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes. Uh, usually developers uh, do their own little framework and their own little mini UI toolkit. 
Uh, this is because if you want to make plugins, you often end up reusing a lot of things. It's good to have tools that work for you as best as possible. <laughs> like uh, the good plugins that I know usually go towards something like this. You test cross-platform because you work, want to have as many users as possible. Um, you do a proper build. Some actual commercial plugins don't actually care for this. I don't know why. <laughs> and you, if you are a good developer, you go along and try to update according to the specifications. Sometimes specification change. If you don't follow along, your plugin gets uh, unusable. But this is the case we have kind of right now. There's, that's a bit more. Uh, on, the on the left side, I have the plugins the, that were probably in formats that currently work on Linux. There's a few more, but it mostly internal things. On the right side, we have stuff um, does not directly work on Linux. So I'm focusing on this talk regarding this section here. Um, the v these two are separate, I'll explain soon. Um, why do we have so many plugin standards, actually? So many plugin formats? Uh, one of the reasons is that developers are typically stubborn, very. <laughs> And uh, I, I can say for myself, I am a little bit as well. <laughs> um, and like when you do a product in a company, if when you have a fight, usually the project manager sort it out, sorts it out for you. But when you're making a plugin format, you're actually making something that is open, something that is going to be used by other people. So there's a lot of consideration. You cannot just, it's not an internal thing. It's some you have to make sure it works well, otherwise people just complain and your format is just useless. You'll have to redo it again and people will complain even more because now you have two standards. It's, let's see, let's see. There's different targets as well. So one plugin format that works well for, um, let's say, Kind of in the network setup where you have multiple computers, everything uh, with the target of rendering complex pieces might not be the same target as some, some embedded device, for example, that only wants to play one instrument. So in this case, you might use different formats and not one that tries to do everything. Because if you try to do everything at once, it might not work so well. Um, there's always something missing when you do a format that's I mean, you cannot pr predict the future, so you might do a form and say, everything is nice, we support all cases, and then comes along a new thing, it's like, mm, I forgot to support this thing. We have to make something new. And then you have another format, yay. Uh, there's, sometimes there's the case of not implemented here syndrome, that's actually a name, uh, in the case that when you make an application, you often, because you have to support a bunch of things, what usually happens is that you either you convert, for example, if your application is mostly about supporting VSTs, whatever other formats you support, you kind of convert them behind the scenes into a VST and then load the, the plugin, or you try to have your own internal format inside the application that then maps into all the existing formats. Uh, so, in kind of few cases, applications end up having their own internal format. And because you you spend so long working on this, you kind of start to believe that your format is actually better than the others, in a way. Because, I mean, it works for every single use case that you know of, of course. It doesn't crash, so you start thinking, hmm, maybe my... my internal thing that I did for my application actually would work as an actual plugin format. And then you release it and then, bam, another plugin format. There it is. <laughs> it happens sometimes. I mean, for my own application, my own plugin host, there's an internal thing. Uh, for my own plugin framework, DPF, there's an internal API as well, because you have, always have to follow one. Um, 
most of the frameworks uh, that you use to facilitate building multiple plugins at once have their own internal thing because that's just how it is. Unless you code in a specific format, for example, VS2, VS2 one on two, and then you have to convert, but you always lose something. There's always a, a trade-off in these cases. Um, I there is also one note that nobody likes to handle plugin formats except their own because they always think you know I did this the, it can it handles all the cases is probably quite it should be good for other people except they think this before talking to others. Uh, <laughs> I have the case sometimes of um, plugin standards being so annoying, like you, when you try to develop a plugin, you investigate the, the specification, everything, you get so irritated, at it, uh, ir irritated with it that you start thinking, screw this, I actually do my own format because this thing is so insane, so crazy, no one should, should, be, should need to handle this, it's insane. And I actually so one new format, and I actually tried to do it as well, but then I, I thought oh, this makes no sense as, as well. But some formats came out of people just being frustrated with the existing ones and just thinking to themselves, I can do better than this. Um, documentation sometimes is missing, which helps in for this situation. We, we know LV2 is a bit tricky sometimes on this. Because there's, it's a bit older now. It's been going through several iterations, some little changes. Uh, the documentation no longer applies, so you people do get a little bit frustrated. And you have the cases sometimes of developers that want to rush. You want to release your plugin as soon as possible. Um, so you end up doing something very nice, but it does not actually follow the specification completely. I had cases like this where a plugin cannot open its own UI in my own host, but it works on others. And the reason is that the developers didn't bother to implement the plugin properly. So you add a little bit of hack here and there for specific plugins, because otherwise the plugin does not load. If the plugin does not load, people will just blame you because it works fine in other hosts. So it's your problem. Um, for open source things, sometimes not really the case because you can fix it, you can see the code, you can see where it is, you can send patches. It helps a little bit. For commercial things, you, where do you even report tickets? There, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to send an email and hope they, they care. Sometimes they don't. Maybe the company does not exist anymore. And that's it. You have to have workarounds everywhere inside the code just to support specific plugins. Sometimes the plugins also have workarounds to support specific hosts because they also sometimes don't follow the standard completely. If the documentation is lacking, people start interpreting the format in misleading ways as well. Uh, because, I mean, documentation is not clear. You don't know exactly if you should do one way or the other. We have multiple applications, developers that think differently, so you end up with a standard, but people just do things differently and never work um, in the same way, which is a bit sad. So st making standards is quite hard, not just for plugins, but in general. In the text you need to write regarding standards needs to be direct, but also um, in a way that is understandable, and there's always people that find nitty picky things new. Th it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I want to go through the differences of the um, of the formats that exist. I'm going to start with VST, which we can also call it VST2 um, because it's the most famous one. Um, it actually started. I don't know how long it is. I'm not going through the history, actually, of the plugins themselves, of the plugin specs, because I don't think it's, we don't actually need this for this talk. Most about what already exists today and what it can do, what it cannot do. Um, 
In the case of VST, VST, it got so popular because it was one of the first. So people were like, Ooh, I can make plugins. So I, an application can be extendable uh, in a way. Uh, you probably know, I mean, if you don't, I'll explain a little bit because it does can do audio effects, can do MIDI as well. MIDI being the events you send with the piano keyboard and um, uh, the knobs as well. Can do the parameters, although in a very weird way, because all the values inside VST are normalized between 0 and 1. So if you want to display the actual value of a plugin, you have to ask it, like, what does this 0 0.5 actually mean? And then it says, hey, it's sustained off. Really? OK. <laughs> uh, it's one thing that uh, I don't know why they went for this. Maybe it makes it simpler in some cases. It's probably because the application was programmed in this way. So to make it easier for them, the standard also follows it. Um, it allows for presets, uh, which is combinations of parameters, basically. Um, the custom interfaces, this was the thing that actually made it quite popular, because now you have fancy UIs together with your plugin. And people, at least the ones that are not very technical, they love the UIs, because they look, they look so fancy, so nice. Like you cannot make a plugin anymore, sadly, if it doesn't have a good interface. People usually kind of dismiss it. <laughs> I mean, it also shows in a way that you care and you have some polish because you spend some time designing a good interface. But it does not really mean if the plugin is good or not. It's just you had a designer or paid a designer and he did some work for you. Um, there's custom state as well, which means it's not really parameters. Could be um a file that you loaded, or even something that you draw, or some something that are not always defined as parameters, something that you can automate. This was in the case of VST. There's more stuff regarding latency, uh, uh, audio buses, extra audio buses, other, other stuff. But actually, there's a lot of bad things as well. In the slides, I'm not going to show the um, the bad things, because I don't want to focus too much on the, on them, but I do want to mention them because people should know. Um, like VST is a very old standard; it was one of the first. The fact that it's VST two is is I mean, there's a reason for it because it used to be VST one. The good thing is that it actually keeps uh, good and bad thing. It keeps the old stuff that it had before. So plugins made with quite a few years ago still work today as VST because the interface remains the same. Um, but it also means that uh, there's a lot of stuff inside the standards. I would say around 75% that it's completely unused by 99% of the plugins. Because the, you look at the documentation, there's so much stuff going on there, and you don't care. Most um, it was mostly a test, I guess, because they wanted to support almost everything, but in the end, it in the, ended up not being used much. Um, one bad thing about VST and most plugin standards, actually, is that they are binaries, uh, which means if you want to know what what is inside this little binary you have inside your computer, you actually have to load them first, then you can figure out what the plugin tells you. This has the bad side effects that if if you load a, a bad plugin, because developers sometimes are lazy, we have I showed you that um, sometimes you go to the easy path and you make bad plugins. Um, plugins can crash your application. That's matter of fact. We have a question already. Yeah, does, does it mean um, if you have a, a huge sample library like 16 gigabyte or so and you want to just ask what is this for a plugin, does it have to load all the 16 gigabytes first? No, because that you, unless it actually is hard coded to have this in memory, sometimes it does, yeah. <laughs> hopefully not. Um, but in this case, this sample library would be something that it loads after being, after being loaded the first time, you tell it to load the state, 
and then it loads the entire thing. The only problem would be imagining that this plugin loads this huge library by default, which means, yes, if you want to scan it, um, it will take quite some time. Okay. What some applications uh, decided to do first was to start an external process to load the, the plugin data. So if the external process crashes, it doesn't crash your main application. They also do the quick scanning, which means they don't actually load the binary. They just try to figure out what's inside. Um, this is just hacks around because plugins, the standard is not that nice and it was not thought in this case. For VST, another thing that got added in the spec that's not being used, we have the VST XML which is actually metadata, but it's not stored inside the binary. But I have, I have to see at least one host that implements this. So far, I didn't see a single plugin or host that actually uses this part of the spec, which would mean that the hosts don't have to crash when scanning. Like, it's part of the specification, but no one actually does it because it's not enforced. Um, Another limitation is that it has one single MIDI port. Um, it's hard to describe exactly what it means, but it, you cannot have more than one MIDI input or more than one, one MIDI output. But that's a small limitation. Um, the normalized parameters, I, I, um, I explained you, everything to zero to one, although it's not just this spec, it's not just VST. Other, other formats decided to do the same. Uh, but on VST, they has the bad case of if you're automating a parameter and we want to know the the what to display in case of a future thing that you're going to get, like your parameter is zero now, but in the future it's going to be 0 0.7, you have actually have to change the value of the plugin to 0 0.7, ask, ask what's the value of this, what it corresponds to, and then change back to what the value was before, which is quite nasty. Uh, I saw some host doing something quite nice, nice in a way, that actually does, uh, I think, 100 steps of rendering of all the values. And then it tries to, in a smart way, figure out if it's um, something that is like an on-off, something that scales linearly, logarithmically, just based on those entire renders of the values. It's a bit nasty, but also a bit smart as well. It, it shouldn't be needed. Um, resizing windows in VST, because sometimes you want to make the window bigger or, not, or smaller, uh, is quite a pain, really, especially on Windows. There are so many hacks on this. It's, it got to really, really, really insane. That's the only thing I can <laughs> say. Um, the standard is extensible, but in a very ugly way. And because it's not part of the actual uh, standards, you, you cannot really expect to have extensions in VST. There's only one or two that are actually supported. You can, if you load the plugin, you just expect it. Like extensions, even if they are good, do not be supported. Uh, another bad thing is that the plugins are identified by a unique ID, which is um, a number. That's actually, the specification says that to load the session, you use this ID to identify the plugin. So you cannot have officially, just hosts eventually figure out a way around it. You cannot have the same version of the plugin installed in two different places because they share the same ID. And you have to register in a website somewhere that um, you want this ID for you, which most developers don't do. <laughs> so you end up with conflicting IDs quite uh, a little bit sometimes. So hosts uh, had to work around the thing, not just saving the, the unique ID, but saving the file path, say, in figuring out a way that it loads your session correctly. Um, License is quite the issue for VST, especially in open source, because it's not an open license, 
which means if you make a plugin using the official SDK, SDK uh, the official PST SDK, you cannot actually release the code in a GP, in GPL, which is the usual license. Um, which means uh, it's, it conflicts with open source values in a way. We have a free um, reverse engineered version of the VST, which is not the entire thing, but just the base bare bones uh, of what it can do, which is enough to build plugins and to build uh, hosts out of it. But even this, I mean, the company that makes VST does not actually like people doing this. And I'll, I'll get to that a bit later. Um, it is a dying format now uh, by its own company because VS, there's now VST3, so the company wants to kill this uh, spec. Uh, in fact, after two more days, actually, what today is 27, so you have three more days to register with Steinberg, the company that makes the standard, to actually get a copy of the VST SDK. In three more days, if you register, you're no longer allowed to make VST2 plugins. That's because they don't want you to. They want you to move to the new one. So, and is a commercial company, you don't get a say in this. <laughs> I mean, you can try your luck and still do it, that, but then, as it happened before, they can send you a DMCA and try to bring your project down because they, it's their copyright in a way. It's, it's not nice, but anyway. Uh, VST3. The main issue myself that I have with this is that the name is completely misleading. Uh, is that it has nothing to do with VST2. Yeah, you think it is, but no. Uh, the only thing that it has is the name and the company behind it, and some small ideas of, I mean, it's a plugin standard, yeah. But VST2 and AU, for example, could and uh, these two compared and audio units or LV2, they're quite uh, similar in the way that they're also completely different. Like, don't don't expect a plugin that works in VST2 to suddenly, in an update, going to support VST3 because no, it's not how it works. It's there's a lot of marketing behind VST3 to try to make it a thing. Developers don't like it because now we have to support a new thing and the old one still works fine. It's only the company that made it that wants everyone to upgrade. Uh, so it gets confusing. It's still a binary format, so it means you have to load the thing, the binary, so it can crash your host. Um, this also has the VST XML metadata, which is stored outside of binary, but as expected, most hosts don't support this. <laughs> um, license is a lot better than before. You can actually make proper open source plugins with the um, with VST3, uh, but now it's become more than just a plugin format. They have an SDK so big in a way that you have to compile quite a lot of files just to get a basic plugin uh, working. Like it used to be that you have a, a single file as a reference for your um, for your base that's how the um, reverse engineered gpl version got uh, but now uh, they for the developers here vst3 is no longer a c a simple c api is a very complex very big c++ thing which might get into issues regarding compiling for for windows uh, from the open source side i'm not sure I have to try still um, it's very commercially oriented in the way that they don't care so much about open source. Like Linux only has support for VST3 since a few months ago because um, a contributor actually decided to help them um, to make VST3 work in here. So if we want to make it work for other um, architectures or other platforms that are not Linux, like BSD, you actually have quite a, some work to do first before it actually starts working there, because it's more than an SDK. Uh, I, for personal reasons, I find the, 
the, the specification to be quite ugly. Uh, the way they use IDs to define every single thing, every single object, and UTF-16 that you're forced to use because it's the thing that they use in Windows, I guess. Uh, hmm? WTF-16. WTF-16, yeah. Why? why? Uh, I actually skipped the, the things it does. Uh, I forgot, but one thing that VST2 did was dynamic inputs or outputs, but you had to do it when the plugin loads initially. With VST3, dynamically can remove things, uh, and it's actually part of the spec in a better way that the old one was. I mean, it's the documentation is a lot better. They have... Um, the thing looks a lot better than before, because they learned some lessons. I guess that might be a reason why they, they want everyone to move. Uh, you have multi-MIDI ports, so you ha can have more than one MIDI input, one or more than one MIDI output. Note expression, which means in each note that you play, you can have uh, the pitch can be modulated and the panning and other a bunch of things that you can apply per note, not just an entire effect, or sometimes you use MIDI channels. Uh, but I put it in quotes because it's a lot of work to actually support on the plugin side, so just saying that the spec supports note expression does not mean much because most plugins will not have it. Um, it supports remote controllers, which is about um, loading your UI, your GUI, in a different computer from where your actual host application is um, running on. It's a big thing for LV2, but VSC3 also uh, has it. Uh, single bundle is actually something that I find quite nice, at least for um, developers that want to ship uh, just one single download. This means that you can ship a VSD3 and have Windows, Mac, Linux, 32-bit, 64-bit, everything inside a single folder. Um, they, I mean, this I find quite nice. But I don't know how they define the architecture in this case. Um, I mean, I didn't study VST3 too much. In Linux, we only have a single plugin collection from the UHE um, developer that releases for VST3. I mean, it's very new to Linux, and personally, I hope it doesn't succeed too much because we have we have better stuff to on Linux to support like L L L LV2. But off with VST and commercial stuff. Um, Latspa is the one that started in Linux, kind of has um, an open source VST, but they wanted to make it as simple as possible. This means um, it does audio, it does not do MIDI, and it has controls, um, input and outputs, and that's it. There's nothing else in the standards to do anything else. You don't have like loading files, custom UIs, anything. I mean, the entire thing is quite small. It's one of the big things about it and one of the bad things about it as well. If you wanted to support in an application, it's quite simple. And that's why sometimes even new projects end up supporting Latspa because you gain access to a bunch of uh, func functionality, a bunch of plugins that already exist over the years. And it's not really that hard to actually implement something like this. And it's quite nice, but you know, the, there's still the bad things that it doesn't do much. <laughs> you, you can do audio effects, cool, yeah. Uh, it's also, now for the bad things, like it's also a binary format, so you have to load the plugins if you want to know information about them, so it can crash your host as well. Uh, he asking before even loading plugin. That's correct. If the plugin is made in such a bad way that it crashes uh, when it's first loaded, because you have to load the plugin to find out what it's inside, you can basically crash the host just by loading this little thing you put there. Then you have to find out which plugin is crashing your entire thing and go there and delete it. Then, hey, I got my session again. <laughs> um, yeah, he has the experience. <laughs> uh, this copy one ugly thing from VST, which is the unique ID, which means 
For the host to identify what, what plugin is inside, it uses an integer, which I don't know why they decided to go with this. And you also have to register to a website, which no longer exists, because it is no longer maintained. Uh, so it, it, it's a bit ugly. The way they, the way they do the, um, the default values for the controls, for the parameters, is, I find it quite ugly. But it's one of one small thing. Uh, it's not extensible, so this is what you get. I mean, if you want simple stuff, yeah, you can have simple stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and after Latspa came L R L R F D F. Uh, I don't know how to say this. It basically is R D F on top of Latspa. It's not actually a new plugin format. It's just metadata on top of uh, Latspa. It provides three things. Um, real default values instead of using complicated hints, presets in an actual defined way so you can share it across applications, and defines units for your uh, parameters. So it's neat. Liter I, mean, I mean, maybe two hosts in the entire Linux application suite support this. Ardor, Ar Ardor supports this. Carly in the way sometimes, and uh, Jack Rack maybe, and I don't think anything else. Because <laughs> his RDF is quite ugly to look at, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, it, they also learned some lessons from this eventually. But anyway, moving on. We have DSSI, which is the one that came after LASPA, because developers wanted a little bit more than just controls. Uh, the idea was to not reinvent what already exists. So we got MIDI, although only input, not output, based on the ALSA um, API. We got GUIs, in this case using OSC for getting messages from the plugin to the um, GUI. And some extra things like defining what is the default MIDI CC for each of the parameters. Uh, you can also finally store um, data that is not just parameters, although it, it works. I actually like the standard, the way they did this, but it's also very, a little bit limiting as well. And it defines presets, but in this case only on the plugin side, not on the host side, which can get a bit tricky because then you cannot, um, you cannot do presets in a way that works on all applications because they're all going to do it in a different way. It's not a predefined uh, spec. Um, it's still binary, so you have to load the plugin as well. Um, but it doesn't use IDs anymore. The developer said that makes no sense. Good, good. Uh, but they decided to use file names, which is a bit better, okay, I guess. Um, it's for me, I still find it a bit simplistic. It's good in what it does, yeah? Because now you have GUIs, you have MIDI, nice. But you cannot go do very complicated things with it. You get into its limitations after you want some spectrum analyzer, if you want something more, like something that loads very big samples. Um, you, you get into issues eventually yeah, when it grows. Um, the GUI is using OSC, which is nice in a way because your application probably already supports it, but also means it has to go through the network. So if somehow you have an issue in your network, you cannot show the GUIs for your, your plugins anymore. Yeah. Uh, but okay, this is for the, the SSI. The one that we're mostly interested in is LV2. That's the new fancy thing, yay. <laughs> uh, because it's, I mean, I started with the bad things because I want to get them out of the way. The idea was to make it extensible and to reuse LATPA, forget about the SSI. But there was some ideas from RDF that were good with the authors at the time. So they decided to, to keep the ideas from there in a slightly different way, it's not RDF, it's Turtle. Um, so, and to try to support everything, it makes it extensible. 
So what happened was that someone decided, like, in the beginning there was no MIDI support for it, so someone decided to make an extension for MIDI, and then it was not that great actually, so there we came with the events, and the events were actually not good either, so then we have another one. So to make MIDI, we got three different ways. People now only go for the latest one, which is the Atom, but uh, in the history of LV2, we have three MIDI APIs, three states, three different ways to save, two different ways to save state, and currently right now, this is still active, is two, di two different ways to handle parameters. You have the controls from LATPA, and you have more th fancy things, things that can change, um, uh, it's better to not try to explain everything too much. <laughs> But there are still two different ways to handle parameters. Uh, we still use mostly the, the old way. And supporting all the toolkits inside the actual LV2 specification, which I... Why? Why is this part of the specification? Because he's asking why is this part of specification. The idea was to make it extensible, and everybody started to want to add a little bit of everything, and you know it became a little bit messy. Uh, this is the part that is, now we're fighting against it, like, you think something is good at the beginning, you don't know, you have to learn, and you make a mistake, and then you only realize a, bit, a little bit too late. <laughs> yeah, like, the supporting all the toolkits seemed a good idea at the time, because you can reuse your system toolkit, you can make things in GTK, Qt, but we got into issues because we cannot mix those things well. So now, what I hope happens is that this last thing gets deprecated so that developers know, don't use this, please. And the next version of hardware actually will not load these kind of UIs anymore. Yeah, which is a good way to force developers to move. Happily, like GuitarX developers and Calf are already working to not depend on GTK anymore. So by the time Ardor gets version six, hopefully you already have the the plugins that caught up a little bit with it. But bad stuff out of the way. We have quite two good things. We have a question. Yeah. Uh, for you to repeat, how how many um, plugins are there that still use GTK? Is it Many, or is it just these two? It's asking how many plugins still use GTK or Qt as well. Um, I can tell you there's GuitarX, the entire collection, Calf, uh, Invada, uh, IR.LV2, there's Newtonator, QMIDIARP, the plugins from Rui, um, AM Synth. Yeah, yeah, it's it. It is a little bit. The list is a bit long. Yeah, <laughs> but anyway, try to focus on the good stuff now. <laughs> we finally have a proper way to save the ID of the plugin, which is the URI, which is a global identifier for the plugin. Um, this actually means that you can move the plugin around in your system or in another computer. Does not matter where it will load. The host knows that this uh, plugin has a unique identifier, but it is something that is actually a big, it's not a number anymore, and it always works. That's one of the biggest things about LV2. Um, you cannot have the same plugin installed in two different places, but LV2 is smart about this, that it detects which version of the plugin is newer, and it will load the new version. So if you upgrade your plugin, you don't know where to put it, you put it somewhere else, the old version just gets ignored, which in a way is quite nice as well. Um, you no longer have to load the binary in order to get information about the plugin, which means it no longer crashes your host when you load the metadata. And for this, it's also one of the ugly things about LV2, the way they decided to do the metadata, which is in a turtle format. For users, it's not an issue, because they usually don't see it. Um, but for developers, that's usually the big uh, thing that they see and think, why did you go with this? <laughs> but after you get used to it, then okay, it's understandable. It, what, one question. 
Hmm? Uh, he's asking what's the issue with uh, Turtle. Um, one thing is that is more. It seems more made for machines rather than humans to read. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah. The yeah. The, he's saying that the entire purpose of it is like this, um, which is true. The thing is that if you want to make a plugin, you have to write this file yourself to describe what you have in the plugin and you have to write it by hand. So it, you have, for a long time, before we have uh, tools to parse correctly this metadata, we have some, sometimes plugins that got a, um, a typo in your uh, plugin metadata and the entire thing does not load or load is loading correctly. Um, now we have parsers and the library that loads these files. This metadata is a lot more strict, so it, there's an error, it tells you. Um, so for now it's, it's better, but before it was a bit painful. Um, it was one of the things that pushed some developers away, the turtle thing. You have to write it manually. It's, you don't want to do this usually. Uh, another question. What do you think would be better? He's <laughs> asking what I think would be better. It's, I will come to it in the, in the next slide after this. Um, one good thing we have is full portable state. Uh, it's not just files that you s save. Like when you save a session, you might have uh, references to files in your file system, and then you move computers, and those files are no longer there, or you moved somewhere else. LV2 sp specifies a way that um, you link the files, trying to make it simpler. Um, it makes the files in a way that it links to your current directory, to your current project, so you can export the project and your files are going to be there, if the plugin does it properly, of course, um, which is quite nice. Usually with other standards, they just, for portability's sake, they end up saving the entire file inside the, the chunk of the, of the save of the plugin. So if you, if you load, uh, 100 megabyte pack of sample files you save your project is now 100 megabyte big in some for some plugins because of this with lv2 we don't need this the specification covers um, cases like this um, we have a proper embed ui which is not the case of the ssi because the ui is going over the network it's an external one now you can pr properly show it on the host and do whatever you want with it uh, you have time at uh, synchronization, which is also on VST, for example, but not on LASP and the SSI. There's a lot of many other things we can do as well with LV2, uh, but I have to get the next one. Uh, future for uh, LV2. LV3, no, I will not count on it, because then we have yet another format. It's probably not a good idea to do it. But some ideas have been uh, spoken about regarding LB2 developers, which is to remove the old stuff, like we learned the lessons, we should probably not keep old stuff just for comp compatibility's sake or something like, figure out a way to remove the old stuff. Um, and instead of using Turtle, maybe start using JSON. It's but JSON LD, which is not exactly the same as JSON, but it, if you read it, you st it's still more. It looks more uh, comprehensible than Turtle files, at least uh, in my perspective. Um, why not use XML? asking why not use XML. I mean, if I was going to use XML, I'll probably use Turtle instead. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, LV2 has a lot of baggage because of bad decisions. But even with this, I still believe it's the, um, it's the best format out of all of them. And, well, it's better to keep going. <laughs> uh, there's also Jack as a standalone, which is kind of like a plugin format. Uh, it can do audio and MIDI. I mean, we have the previous presentation showing that you can have audio and then interconnect things. So you can imagine every single box in there as a plugin, kind of. There's transport synchronization between them. 
And now recently, we got metadata in Jack 2, which means uh, each client and each port can have metadata, any kind of metadata inside um, itself. So you can define, um, usually what we have now is icons, uh, port ordering, some custom names if you want, for example, in other languages as well. And you can define a URL if you want to get more information, like documentation, things like this. So in a way, because of metadata, it can be extensible. You just have to define um, what these properties are. Uh, what should you, you, you use? I really think um, it's LV2, but really, work, use whatever works for you, because that's the point. Um, but please don't make another format, because <laughs> I, I think we really have enough. Uh, just a second. <laughs> Conclusions. Um, VST, VST2, VST was first. Uh, LV2 had a rough start, but it's getting there, and we're in the good state now, I believe. Uh, VST2 is very ugly and hacky in a way that there's a bunch of hacks everywhere to make the old stuff work. It does work mostly, but if I mean, if you're a developer, I have to handle VST. Fine, until you try to support multiple hosts or multiple plugins, then you're like, ah, very frustrating. VST two uh, is completely different from VST three. That I mean, it's something to keep in mind. Uh, Steinberg can be nasty. Yes, I mean, you're not allowed to make VST two plugins anymore unless you sign the agreement uh, before the end of this month. Um, but even with open source projects, we have the case of a few, because we use the reverse engineered uh, VST file, which has the same name for compatibility reasons with the official SDK. These uh, open source projects got the MC8 by Steinberg. And they, the thing we did for now was just to rename the file so it doesn't match. And hope, I don't know, it, we hope the, the reverse engineering was made in a clear way that doesn't, I mean, that's how it works. It should not conflict. It's open, it's an API. But we have, to, it's, we have always to be a little bit on watch. So maybe just don't care about VST and go for LV2. Um, <laughs> uh, LV2 copying Latspa was a little bit of a mistake we still have to handle for now. Um, We'll keep the old stuff because for compatibility reasons, we don't want to break the old plugins that already exist. Uh, but we have, we know what exactly what we need to do to make it better, just lack of manpower. And it's also a thankless job because no matter what you do, you're not going to please everyone. And if you do one thing that is not going to work well for an, an application, they're going to be mad at you because you just now you give the developers a bunch of work that they didn't need just because you think it's better. So eventually, everybody hates the guy behind LV2. So I feel a little bit a little bad for David, but we all I'll like you, David. So <laughs> it's, it's you're doing a good job. Keep it up, and that's it. Thank you. All right, if you still have any questions, please yes. let me know. Yes. Yes. Uh, I have a question from, from Robin. Yeah. From IRC. <laughs> um, um, what bad decisions... Um, can you ask what bad decisions uh, Philip alluded to? Yeah, uh, I mean, this is a technical thing, so I didn't want to mention too much. But for example, the connect port, uh, even David agrees a little bit on this, that it was a bad decision to use. Because every time you want to run the plugin, sometimes you have to connect ports because the buffers have changed. And instead, you could just, in the run function, pass a struct, and the struct contains the, the audio buffers, which Drobil already has a, an example header file how could, this could be done with using the morph extension. So the audio buffer can already contain some other things at the same time by morphing to other thing. And if the first uh, member of the struct is an audio buffer, 
it can we can have backwards compatibility with uh, with the old plugins although this is completely technical it's something better to discuss <laughs> some other time but that's one of the examples there's more but i'll discuss with you online i have a question yeah. uh, do you think that this whole VST2, VST3 debacle is going to maybe drive some users from the commercial realm towards open standards like LV2? I believe so. Some already did, to be honest, because um, mm. the only problem is that uh, developers are used to LV2, the VST and having, even if nothing complete, is a, and a bit... Um, Ugly documentation, there's some documentation, and they have a bunch of examples because the spec is old, there's a bunch of stuff to look at. And they count 12v2, and they have to learn Turtle. They have to figure out a bunch of things which work in completely different ways, and they also give up sometimes. Or just sometimes decide to make their own format because they didn't like LV2 Shit. at all. <laughs> It does help a little bit. Uh, the only thing is that LV2 is not so big on uh, um, Windows and Mac, so we have to take it in consideration. If they do start playing around with LV2, they don't have a lot of plugins. I mean, it's just the circular dependency thing. There's not a lot of plugins, and then there's not a lot of applications that support mm -hmm. these plugins. It needs to start somewhere. It's not easy, but it's the same for uh, VST3. So, uh, luckily for now, it's not big on Linux. We'll see how it goes. Another question. Thanks. This is more of a user question for someone who just uses plugins. Um, supposing your processing power is somewhat limited, but you still want to use the plugins that you're used to. Are there any hands-on ways that you can increase? your um, you know, <laughs> CPU capability without the machine exploding when you've got too many plugins working at the same time. As a programmer, do you know of any tweaks that you could do? I mean, if you're... Difficult question, I know. It's a bit generic as well, but yeah. the trick is always to optimize in this case. Uh, trick, not trick, because you might spend just a few months to optimize something that takes one millisecond even less uh, that's how it works like if you have a the easy path you make a plugin then you if you want to optimize to work to load and work as much as fast as possible that's one of the hardest things to do because you can optimize so much that you didn't even notice that half the things also broke at the same time <laughs> it's i mean it's tricky usually you end up just writing assembly in this case not in a higher level, but running the actual thing that the binary, the system is going to do per plugin. Um, I don't know if that's a good enough <laughs> answer or not. I'll work with it. Right. So, no more questions then. Thank you very much.